on stage, Bob Grossman. Good evening, everyone. I can't tell you how happy I am not only to be alive and to be playing music, but to be doing it right here tonight. This place is one of the best. Well, I'm just a rattlesnake. I sting every man in this world. I'm just like a rattlesnake. I, I sting every man in this world. I ain't never had no job. I just keep on rolling through this world. Since 2002, I've been an adjunct professor at Macquarie University in Sydney in the Department of Contemporary Music Studies. And I first heard Papua New Guinea and string band music when I was on tour in Australia the next year. I've been something of a musical anthropologist and collaborator with musicians from uh, all over the world for a few decades, uh, starting with Hawaii and moving into Africa, West and East Africa, Madagascar reunion, Okinawa. Uh, Greece, uh, any number of places, and uh, for me, you know, the journey is uh, really kind of determines the goal. <laughs> Dennis Crowdy has been a lecturer at Macquarie for several years, and his specialty is string band music from Papua New Guinea. He has a particular fondness for the Tolai people of Rabaul and their brand of string band music, and he was keen to have my first project with Macquarie be a collaboration with these guys. How far away is that from the mainland there? A couple of hours by speedboat. Wow. Yeah. Great. Here at the Department of Contemporary Music Studies at Macquarie University, an important research focus for Professor Philip Hayward and myself is contemporary music, particularly in the Pacific and various island cultures. We chose Bob because of his previous collaborative work with a variety of musicians around the world, uh, but particularly the sort of work he's done with an island focus, the Pacific focus, and in, with musicians in places like Papua New Guinea. We were particularly interested in Bob because of the vibe he brings to the relationship, the way he works with musicians, uh, and the sorts of longer term follow-up and contact that's essential to those longer-term music relationships. I knew about the volcanic situation there in Rabaul and how the town was so devastated and what a tough time people are having rebuilding it. And string band music seems to provide a lot of hope there in the community. So when Dennis offered me the chance to go and collaborate with five different string bands, I jumped at the chance. My program for this year is already pretty full but I've got some spare time late in the year, and so in November, Dennis, cameraman Phil Donison, who grew up in Rebel, and I, with an assortment of recording equipment, instruments, spare strings, tuning pegs, and picks, head off for New Britain. During his time in PNG, Dennis had made some pretty good friends and contacts in the local music scene. Two of them, the Thomas Lulungan and Daniel Biang, will be organizing the bands we hope to record. Yeah, I like to work with different, different musicians. For me, the, the music that's not interesting anymore is American music. The rest of the world, a lot of interesting music. Our hotel is virtually the only building left standing in the center of the volcano's most devastated area. 
the island lies about 100 kilometers due east of the Papua New Guinea mainland. Rabaul is on the Gazelle Peninsula, on the shores of Simpson Harbor in Blanche Bay. The town began life in 1909 as Simpsonhofen, a German colonial headquarters. Prior to that, from 1899, the village of Kakapo, a few kilometers down the coast, had been headquarters to the Germans. Rabaul was eventually chosen because of its better harbor. In September 1914, not long after the beginning of the First World War, an Australian expeditionary force captured Rabaul and German New Guinea became an occupied territory. Today, very few signs of the German presence are left. An old jetty at Kapakal near Kakopo, and the ruined gates of the governor's residence on lonely Namanula Hill. After the Great War, between 1920 and 1941, Australia administered their League of Nations mandate over New Guinea from Rabaul until a violent eruption of Vulcan and Tavurvur in May 1937 caused the death of over 500 people, the evacuation of the town, and the eventual removal of the capital to Ley on the mainland. On January 23, 1942, during their South Pacific rampage, the Japanese army occupied New Britain and made Rabaul their major South Pacific base. The fortifications and hundreds of kilometers of tunnels they created remain as stark reminders of a dark period in Rabaul's history, even today. A massive campaign of Allied bombing once again all but destroyed the town, and in September 1945, the Japanese surrendered. During the occupation, 20,000 tons of Allied bombs were dropped on Rabaul and its surroundings. The results of the bombings can still be seen on shore and in the sea, and unexploded bombs still wreak their havoc from time to time. In 1984, five young men were blown to pieces on Matupi Island, and in 2001, a local man lost his arm and received second-degree burns. Even today, some 60 years on, huge unexploded 500 kilogram bombs are being uncovered and disposed of on a regular basis. We're standing here on Mango Avenue, and I think its name was probably more appropriate before the volcano. As you can see, it's just been completely destroyed. Um, the weight of the ash took down roofs on buildings, and if you have a look at that building there, you can see two meters high of ash everywhere along the sides of the streets. We're still standing above what was the original surface of the street. There's tons of ash coming down still every day here. It's just unbelievable what it's done to this place and how hard people are trying to rebuild it. It definitely puts things in perspective. You just kind of stop worrying about your career and your personal appearance when uh, the volcano's blowing off. And yet, you know, we're still standing in this incredibly beautiful place. And uh, it really gives you a strong feeling in your heart that you really hope that the people here can rebuild and regain their lives. Certainly we're doing what we can on our level, we're helping the musicians. Unbelievable dust from the center of the earth. Since the 1994 eruption, large sections of the original town have not been rebuilt. And today, the center of activity for the region has moved 25 kilometers down the coast to the town of Kokopo. And there, <laughs> everything is hot chili, but never red ones, only green. And never dry, never cooked, only green. And you know why? Because if you eat hot red chili or hot cooked chili, you pay the tax in the morning. Green chili, hot green chili, you can eat all you want, no tax. All right. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, when I'm working, I travel a lot. I work every, almost every day. Mm. Concerts. Um, if two cups of coffee, I'm still not awake. A couple of chilies. chilies. <laughs> You'll be all right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It sort of psych you up also, huh? Yeah. That's also, ma that's magic. Very good with your woman, too. Ooh. Hot chilies. Ooh. If we both eat hot chilies at the hey, same time, eating it. straight well, to bed. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> thanks for the tip. Uh, <laughs> nice tip. Daniel and Thomas have managed to organize five different string bands for us to record. Really uh, separate because we want to get each different style of string band. This area is home to the Tolai people, and this project centers around their music. Over a beer, we get a few of the logistics sorted out. To kind of meet the guys halfway with their music and join in with 
I play. A, I have a background in Polynesian. Okay. So there's some similarities. Right. Like, basically, hope to record, get some good music. Mm -hmm. if anything is released. Everybody shares equally. Right. Whatever the proceeds are. The West has way yeah. too much. Yeah. You know, in the guitar factories in the yes. West, if they get one scratch when they're making the guitar, you know what they do? They throw it away. <laughs> You know, I mean, they're throwing away instruments. And the final thing we need to work out is how we're going to record these guys. Before 1994, there were a couple of studios up here, and a little bit of recording was possible. But after the eruptions, the studios that were destroyed were never rebuilt. They moved to Moresby, and recording up here came to a sudden stop. That's ten years ago. Even though this is a budget session, we want it to work properly. We have to make sure, for example, that we have enough space to fit up to a dozen musicians or more. The art of being an engineer was only, where do you put this guy and where do you put that guy in the room? And Microphone techniques and everything. Yeah, I mean, for example, Louis Armstrong, he played trumpet, he was so loud, they put him behind the drummer. He was the furthest away from the microphone, and in some recordings you can hear him running to sing up to the microphone, right. and then back to play trumpet. <laughs> So, we'll get a live natural recording. Our solution comes via the good graces of the Travelodge. A motel room with a few modifications works fine. Although, as we are about to find out, it gets a little warm in there once it's filled with musicians. Before we get into the business of recording, however, Dennis and I have been asked to visit the local radio station and talk about what we're here for. Just one more indication of how much these people love their local music. We got uh, Tupla visitors uh, to, to Eastern Britain, uh, all the way from the U.S. of A. Uh, we got uh, world-renowned uh, guitarist uh, Bob uh, Brosman. Make some noise. Hey, I'm happy to be here in your beautiful country. And I just can't wait to dive into the music here. I'm a guy that plays music from many places around the world, particularly places near the water. So um, I'm going to take you on a little tour and uh, play you first 100-year-old Hawaiian cowboy song. And then a little South African song, and a Madagascar, a short stop in Calcutta, India, and then back to Hawaii. has one of the strongest guitar band cultures in PNG and is one of the youngest guitar cultures on the planet. As a result, there are several fascinating string band styles and open tunings unique to this area. It seems that some really interesting music emerges in areas with limited access to European instruments and little or no access to European style music education. It seems that the further away from cities that colonized guitarists live, the likelihood of open tunings increases. More and more I'm beginning to realize that open tunings were invented everywhere the guitar went outside of Europe. And this brings up several fundamental questions about how human beings apprehend music and solve musical problems on their own. The first band scheduled to record with us is the Gilnata band, but first they have to make their way into Rabaul from the remote island of Miyoko. Miyoko is a beautiful little island in the Duke of York group, around 30 kilometers to the east of New Britain. The Germans began the permanent European settlement of East New Britain with copra trading posts at Miyoko in 1874. 
Gilnata is perhaps the most pure and untouched by modernism of all the groups I've heard, playing in a fascinating simultaneous group plucking style, with up to 15 singers producing the most unearthly vocals I've ever heard. In all my travels around the world, especially in the very difficult and poor countries, there's an extreme lack of infrastructure for musicians. There aren't instruments, strings, recording opportunities. And uh, I come from a country where there's a tremendous surplus of everything. There's too much of everything in America, guitars, strings. And yet, when I go to difficult countries, like in Africa, I see that the ratio is something like 500 guitar players to every one guitar, and musicians are forced to get bicycle brake cables and unravel them to get eight strings. We've just been changing the strings uh, for the last 45 minutes or so uh, to get a better sound. Helping these guys out with some musical basics on how to put strings on and which strings is which, and see what kind of music we get. It doesn't take us long to realize that our small recording studio in summer, two degrees from the equator, gets a little warm when it's filled with a lot of bodies. <laughs> and it isn't just us who feel the heat. Rabal proves to be a great endurance test for instruments and equipment exposed to unrelenting temperature, humidity, and gritty ash. Shake out the dust. Slacken. Old string. Slacken and shake out the dust and come back halfway and then so new, like new strings. Number five. And I go find number six, okay? But well, maybe you play my guitar. Huh? Is that I play uh, guitar or not? Uh, rhythm. How much do I rhythm guitar about? I gotta grab some. Oh, uh, one, yeah. One yeah. Okay. Now, you got what kind of some lead guitar to us? Yeah, yeah. Alan. Lead vocals. Lead vocals to us. Yes. And Matt, do you need both local Isn't this interesting? This is maybe the youngest guitar culture in the world. These guys are great from the first second. Unbelievable way to hear this singing. It's just spectacular. styles of the first generations of PNG string bands featured a few guitars, one ukulele, and many singers. The slightly younger players added more guitars and developed a distinctive band sound, including one guitarist to play dedicated bass lines. As with Hawaiian and Okinawan music, the bar lines are not regular to Western ears, but follow the lyrics and the feeling of the players, rather than some outside arbitrary rules. It's fascinating and wonderful to observe how musicians approach challenges and solve problems. 
The music is incredibly soulful and uplifting. I find the strongest quality to be an innocence rarely found in music today. The guitars are tuned to a unique open tuning family, locally called Five Key. This tuning was developed fairly recently, after the guitar arrived in the 1950s and 60s in standard tuning. These local five key tunings have five notes in them as opposed to the Hawaiian or blues four key open tunings. The purpose of open tunings generally is to help musicians accompany song and chord changes with open strings. The local tuning gives that extra string for a little more versatility and ease of accompaniment. It reminds me of what Hawaiians must have sounded like in the very earliest days, just after the arrival of the guitar. Except that the one guitarist in the group playing slow, punchy bass lines sounds like the traditional blues of Charlie Patton or Barbecue Bob. And things are going real well until mid-morning when we discover recording in a town that was destroyed by a volcano a few years back has its other little setbacks. Power cuts, power coming on. The power goes down, which means no recording for a couple of hours, and that gives us a chance to get to know one another a little better. These guys don't need practice, they know what they're doing. <laughs> How did you decide to make that style? Like this pulling style, yeah, pulling string. string. Yeah. Did you hear it this somewhere? Did you hear it somewhere else, or? We learn it from our Labun from the place when they, they play around in the village mm. and all of all all Tumbu Nablon Nikola. And we learn it from them. Ah. We take it in, in pulling string. Mm. They have to strike like this. Mm -hmm. And the young people we we coming up, we learn it with a pull the string. You like the sound? Yeah. Yeah. Like this, mm. Mm. And this kind of high singing, yeah. is this your idea or is yeah. many people in the village singing like this? No, our, our, our idea. Oh. My idea to learn it, to teach them. Mm. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Suppose you got solar too, yeah? Um, solar power. Oh, I'm um, slow something, yeah? I'm sorry, go low battery, yeah? So you got solar and you stop look less. You play like stop look less. And now, ah, solar stop. Yeah, you play that. And now, so you can charge him your night time the same night. <laughs> <laughs> Our second group, the Eagle Voice Band, comes from the village on Matupit Island. This island is the closest to the volcano at Tavurvur and changes size and shape with each new eruption. The causeway linking it to the mainland appears and disappears regularly. These changes in the terrain provoked one of the most interesting land rights and property law cases that the South Pacific has ever seen. 
The traditional landowners won their case against the PNG government, who tried to exercise eminent domain, the right of a government to seize private property for public use. Matupi is the second place settled by the Germans after Miyoko in 1875. Because of its closeness to Tavurvur, which produced the most violent eruption in 1994, it was almost totally destroyed. The people were evacuated, and it was three years or more before they were able to return home and start the rebuilding process. We find as we go that the bands range in style and musical complexity. The Eagle Voice Band plays in a style first pioneered in the 1960s, using a few guitars tuned to standard tuning, and 12 enormous vocals. Their sound is more influenced by Fijian music. Fiji had guitars before they spread to East New Britain. According to local folklore, Matupit is on the exact spot where guitars first arrived in Papua New Guinea. Way back in 1882, 1882, the first missionaries came into Rabao. So they landed in Matupit Island. So then music came in. So we are the first people in Matupit, our ancestors, they are the first people to, to know about guitar, you know, music. So that's why we don't even have a hard time to, you know, to come in and record them. Because we, we follow our ancestors, they know more about guitar, so we are the late, I mean, the upcoming musicians. The people here have a natural affinity for music and song, and it's not just the musicians and the bands. Wherever we went, I could put my charango into somebody's hands, and within a few moments, they were mastering it. You want to try? Yeah. Explain hey, them. mommy! Explain them. Ukulele? Yeah. Number one, two, three, four. And this one, same like number two. So me making... No, this one, this one, number one. Hey, look, look, this one, number one. Up. And this is number what? A, two. Oh, yeah. By the time we're ready for our third recording session, we're a little tired of our makeshift studio, so we decide to try something different. This band, called Alir Pukai, loosely translated as Wanderers of the Sea, is based in the village of Raluana, up in the hills off the road between Kakapo and Rabal. And we've decided to take our studio to them. Tony Subam, a friend of Dennis's from Moresby, has joined us and he's operating the console today. Setting up to record in the wilds of New Britain has its challenges, but with the help of a roll of packaging tape, the cameraman's tripod, and a couple of my socks, we're ready to go. When the vocals commence, it sends a shiver up my spine. When the wind comes up, we soundproof our outdoor studio with human beings and woven palm mats.
Once the track is down to everyone's satisfaction, then the vocalists re-record their lines clean to allow us to mix them in at just the right level. The afternoon ends with a band meeting, and the first item on the agenda is to decide who will open a bank account for the guy's royalties once the CD is released. final two bands, Drop Sun and Lions 2000, hail from the north coast on the other side of the volcanic ranges. play in the contemporary style developed in villages around Rabat. When I say contemporary, I don't mean media influenced. But contemporary in the sense of individual musicians who are developing within their tradition and pushing the limits of the style. bands have a higher ratio of players to singers, and the instrumentation typically is three to six guitars, ukulele, and one guitarist playing bass lines. marker. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can't play with fingers, only with the uh, yeah. this, this one. Bar. Bar. Steel bar. Yeah. Wanna try? Try it. Yeah, it's fun. Let's see. Sit down a Not so easy. It's a that's play, play guitar with one finger and you can't bend it. Only one finger, a metal finger.
style of bass playing that has developed within these contemporary string bands is truly unique, both in the tuning and in the phrasing. Another interruption comes along. The rain pounding on the roof in Rabaul sounds like Niagara Falls. So once again, it's out onto the veranda for a smoke and a chat. Well, when we got here, uh, you noticed the swimming pool was empty. Now you can see why. Every time it rains, tons of ash is falling in it. No point in filling it right now while the volcano's smoking. Incredible. Every morning we come out and there's ash all over the ground and it washes away every day. Finally, we get the last of the bands onto the hard drive. This has been incredible. Playing with these guys and listening to them play is just one of the great experiences. <laughs> to celebrate the end of the sessions, Thomas and Daniel organized an informal concert for the bands, their families, and their friends, followed by a farewell feast. Firstly, we would like to talk uh, on behalf of the <coughs> band in here in East Jupiter. We would like to thank uh, Bob Crossman. We would like to be a big big plan line. <laughs> Bob was a new inside tradition of one plus world renowned guitarist. And we travel long ago from the world. And we come by him in our part of the beginning. And we share him this la. Also, I'm a talent blonde and a music blonde and one time you mean. Now, two, I mean, like, some long music blonde you mean, long pop in the beginning, especially your line that you mean, your string band. So, I mean, like, talk about my strong old band, who sat in the beginning, talk, now come up, now stop one time, Bob, now Dennis, now Phil, long working on this recording. All right, all good things, it must come to an end. All right, so today you may favor him, uh, Bob, one time Dennis, and uh, feel long, but you may see that one time, legally, you know, big black guy, guy, so you may be like one time two black, three black, and I'll be able to go tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> 
the one thing, you make one mistake. It's not the end, it's just the beginning. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. So, Bobby like, talks out again, or saying, this lamb, you know, finish blank and blank One time, then it's not uh, fifth. By, I think, now, beginning of the friendship. One time, you may long here long now. All musicians long now. Each new year. So, I think, me like, by me fighting big plan, all musicians play me long here long each new year. Now, me like, when I, little bit talk talk about Bob. <laughs> It's my first time here. I'm sorry, I'm uh, uh, not going to talk busy. Legally. Next time, a little more. Uh, but my ears I hear, the, hear your language of music. And I want to say that the music from here, the Tolai music, the string band music, it's very strong music, like any strong music from Africa, from India, from, from any place. And you should be proud of the work we did. We all worked really, really hard together. And you, you made me feel very welcome. And you told me, ah, that's a mistake. And I said, ah, thank you, teacher, you know. So I, I learned not just 15 songs this week, but I learned a lot about your music. You should be really proud of the music you're playing here. There's only one, one kind of music like this string band music, and it's right here. So thank you for trusting me. Yeah, man. I like these greens. So this project brought together close to 50 musicians with these five bands and an incredible array of heartfelt, soulful talent there. And these guys have changed my life, and I hope that I'm going to change their life a little bit. All the proceeds of the CD are split equally among us all as musicians, so I guess that makes me number 51 out of 51 musicians. And uh, would really love to see these guys get out more and, be, and just more easily become musicians in their lives. Uh, this is the first time many of them have ever been paid to record. The system in Papua New Guinea is a little bit uh, like sharecropping for musicians, so we're trying to change that as well. And of course, this CD will be released all over the world, and we're setting up uh, a means of direct payment to all the musicians involved. As usual, I've got a hectic worldwide concert schedule that takes me around the world at least once a year, if not twice. And uh, somehow I need to carve out some time real soon to start mixing this project, because I'm very, very excited about it and looking forward to an international release in 2005. But, uh, Looks like I may be going back in 2004, and so I want to be able to present the musicians with some mixes, something they can put their hands on and listen to and play for their family and friends. After months of touring, it's good to be back home and in my local studio for a little while. Hey, Bob, come hey, on Hey, up. Daniel. Come up, man. How you been? Oh, good, man. Glad to be getting back to this. The mix is coming along well, and my engineer, Daniel Thomas, can't believe the sounds we've brought back. Right. What are we doing today? Uh, let's, um, let's work on Alir Pukai, and that's... Uh, that is what I got loaded up. Okay, that is, um, that's a group with a fairly small amount of instruments, pretty good recording. He says he's never heard anything like it. One, two, three, four, five. And just have a second half of this about bring it up. One, two, one, two, three, four. As the plane drops in over the momentarily docile volcano, I'm really looking forward to catching up with all the guys again. Thank uh you. -huh.
Unfortunately, we discover Thomas is in Moresby and Daniel is busy organizing a regional festival. So this trip, we're sort of on our own. Luckily, Tony is in Rabal again, so armed with his pigeon skills, we set off to town. For a couple of hours, Tony and I pound the pavement in Rabal, trying to track down members of the mainland bands. At home, you'd just be on the phone, but not too many people have them here. Luckily, we run into a friendly storekeeper who knows where to find Augustine from Lions 2000. The grapevine will start working for us now, and in a day or two, we'll make contact with all the bands and deliver their CDs. But just to be on the safe side, we catch up with an old friend at the radio station and put the word out. The first working day of the week, and that's the Shaking Stevens with one of his old-time hits, uh, A Love Worth Waiting For. And uh, now it's my pleasure to play for the first time on radio, making its debut around the world. Uh, we have a track from Ali Pukai String Band of Rolwana, our very own uh, string band group from here. And this is a mix uh, that was done not long ago by uh, Rob uh, Brosman. And uh, he's brought back uh, a sample of uh, that uh, CD featuring some of the local bands that he recorded here in Eastern Britain uh, during his last trip here. So let's have a listen now to Alir Pukai from Alir Pukai String Band. This is it. Meanwhile, the Gilnata band is out on the island of Miyoko, which means there's only one way to deliver their CD to them. So we're going on a little ocean voyage. This island is so remote that even the boatman from Kakapo has to ask directions.
Unbelievably, the grapevine has worked, and Alan and his band on Miyoko have had word that we were coming, and they've built us a house to stay in for the night. Having the extra time here gives us a chance to take a really good look at how the people on Miyoko live their lives. It really is incredible. So different to any place I've ever been before. Another surprise for me too. Something like this has never happened to me before. Some beautiful thing like this, and nobody has ever made a house for me to sleep in before. Really Thank you. A lot of work. Spending the night on the island gives us the opportunity to join the Gilnada band to give the Miyoko folk a little impromptu concert. Even the little 
littlest kids watch and listen attentively for the entire time. I don't think you'd find that kind of attention span in most Western kids these days. Having to leave beautiful Miyoko is really heartbreaking, but the farewell, as far as the band is concerned, is only temporary. Gilnada have agreed to come to Kokopo on Saturday morning for a farewell concert at the local market. Once we're back on the mainland, our next stop is Ralawana Village to find David and James from the Aliru Pukai String Band. Once again, the CD attracts a lot of local attention. The band is really looking forward to playing it for their family and friends. Within two days, all the bands have a copy of the recordings. All that remains for us to do now is to join the Gilnada band for one final session, this time at the busy Saturday markets at Kokopo. Bringing Gilnada's unique style of music to the mainland towns felt to me like the start of spreading their music around the world.
East New Britain is a beautiful place and many people say that Rabaul was once the most beautiful harbor anywhere in the world, most picturesque and lovely tropical harbor. But it's been destroyed time and time again by volcanoes and uh, if not volcanoes then somebody else's war, usually somebody else from very far away. As a result the Tolai people have had to endure a lot of hardship over a lot of years. <laughs> So given all that hardship that the people there have endured, it's kind of nice to think that perhaps we're helping not only the musicians but their communities as well. If the CD does well around the world, the royalties will actually amount to a fairly large amount of money in that economy and since the musicians live in villages and live communally with extended families, the royalties uh, will get plowed back into the community and yet it'll be money earned by the musicians themselves for their music, their songs and their singing. Perhaps for me the most important thing is that we've now had an opportunity to create a permanent record of this fragile and fantastic music before the rest of the world rolls in and changes it forever. Anyhow, I hope so.
Sense of empathy. 